In 2014-2015, we will be celebrating the 200th anniversary of educational activity on Dudley Hill, which actually means the beginning of the third century of Nichols College. If you come here to the Hill, you immediately see the older buildings, the rather attractive New England countryside, and that's a big part of the sense and the feeling of the place. A small New England college, a great, quaint environment. This college has been transformed to a very modern day institution with incredible facilities to support our students both inside and outside the classroom. It's a vibrant community that focuses on students and their success. There's been an educational institution here on Dudley Hill for close to 200 years and the legacy of that and the tradition of that are important to us today in a very real sense. One of the things that I got asked to do was to visit the classes and tell them a little bit about the roots and connections to Nichols. Over in the admissions department, appropriately, um, I found this sign about Nichols Academy. And it indicates here that the fall term will begin in August and that the spring term will end on June 21, 1861. And I'm thinking to myself, this is the moment of the Civil War. What was happening in Dudley? Well, what was happening in Dudley is school was in session. Talked about expenses, it's always got a laugh from the current students. Four fifty a semester for the common English branch, the higher English branch, six dollars a semester. And then it, it closes that young ladies and gentlemen from abroad residing at the boarding house with the principal are considered as placed entirely in his charge. A careful obs observance of study hours, principal attendance at recitations, at prayers, and at church is required of every student of the school. And no student will be retained whose influence is found to be pernicious. And that, of course, let them know that there was perhaps a different standard than is expected today, and perhaps they had a great deal more freedom in the way they lived their lives on the Hill uh, than students had perhaps 100 or 120 years before. Dudley is a very interesting place. It's rural, but at one point it was somewhat on the cutting edge of our industrial society. America in the early 1800s was a growing new nation. As they expanded, they found a need for a better education. Dudley found itself in the position of having a mass of Nichols who was an industrialist and a universalist interested in putting up an academy. Amasa Nichols was one of the founders of the early textile industry. Uh, later in our history, Samuel Slater, the true originator of the American textile industry with plants in both Rhode Island and here in Massachusetts and nearby Connecticut, was actually on the board of trustees of the academy. New England Universalists were interested in helping him. It was Amasa Nichols' money that built the first academies. And there were two. His first one, first building burned down and the second one uh, it did work uh, for a number of years. The Universalists felt that they had to support all the members of their society, and so women as well as men were included. The question is, what could the woman do? And most of them went into education. The Universalists found themselves overextended a bit. Their center was in Boston, and in 1815, this was a very long ride, and it wasn't soon after that that they determined that they couldn't continue to support Nichols Academy, and some of them left, and the Academy then took on a local flavor, and really that's what sent the Academy on its course. The Academy was extremely important. A number of local people went here. They had to pay. If you had a family of four, you could not send them all there were two choices, really. If you went to the academy, you would learn things, English, geography, astronomy, very basic subjects. There was no such thing as a graduation. You went as far as you felt you should go as an individual, or your parents felt they could pay for you, and then you went off to work. On the other hand, there was one group of academy students who were intending to become ministers and to go on to colleges, although they were not professional schools. 
this dual nature of the academy continued up until almost 1900. Perhaps our leading graduate of the 19th century, Hezekiah Conant, was indeed a major industrialist in the textile area. Later in the 1880s and 1890s, donated the funds to support a total redevelopment of then the Academy's campus, hired prominent architects, including Elbridge Boyden from Worcester, who had a major firm as the designer of Mechanics Hall to design some of the Academy buildings in the late 19th century. By 1890, most of the people in Dudley lived along the French River. The coming to Dudley Hill which was a two and a half mile ride of some kind. So the, the general approach that the academy folks didn't, couldn't almost answer was that they weren't getting enough students. And eventually they were down to nine, and at that point they stopped. I had a tough time when I started my own business because I had to do everything for the first time. Some of the things that I found from Nichols was a big help to me. I learned a lot there about what made up a good organization. The Academy suspended operations in the early 20th century. After a period of transition in the early 1930s, the Nichols Junior College was established by James Conrad. The two-year college was functioning in New Hampshire at a small school there, New Hampton Prep School, and it was focusing on business. There wasn't any room there. So they looked around and they found this area was available. And what was available were these three little buildings plus the estate of Hezekiah Conant, who built the three little buildings in the first place. They managed to put these together into a package, and that meant athletic fields, it meant dormitories for this New Hampton Junior College program. And so it came down here with 11 students, and they added some 50 more. The trustees of Nichols Academy, they said, look, one of the things that you're going to have to do is we're going to maintain the Nichols name. And the president said, sure, that's as simple as that. And then they had their first enrollment in September of 1931. Considering the Depression, the school was remarkably successful as a school of business administration. And that's important to note because it is different from junior colleges as such, which tend to focus on the 13th and 14th years, whereas this school focused on the junior and senior years of college. The college maintained its existence as this two-year school until 1943, when most two-year schools had to close because of the war. All of our students suddenly went off to war. I remember my father leaving. He left in 41 before the war started. I remember when it closed and I remember what we were trying to do to keep it open. Those weren't the best of days, but that was 1943. Opened in 46. At that point, it began to aim to be a four-year school. I came to Nichols in 1950. At that particular time, we had a war going on with Korea. Colonel Conrad called the whole school together and said Washington was setting up a new organization called the Army Reserve. And if you joined that particular group, you stayed with that group. When you were called, everybody would go. Here we know all the fellows that are in Nichols and whatever group that is, I would be happy to go there. So I did join it. In 58, we determined to apply for acceptance as a four-year college, and we had to do this through the state. And in 58, they said, yes, you can be a four-year college. So in 1961, it was such a high point for me, that's when we graduated our first students in the bachelor degree program. We were students here during a transition time in our country. The Vietnam conflict was heating up. The draft was a major issue. 
I had just been discharged from the service. It was the Vietnam War. Military were not the most favored people in this country. Many of those freshmen were here because if you weren't in college, you were going to be drafted. And if you're going to be drafted, you were going to Vietnam. It was a very simple process. The school really welcomed veterans. Colonel Conrad, having started the school, was a veteran of the Army. Dean Quinn, veteran of the Navy. When I met the colonel, I walked into an office. He had a very large desk. He stood up, shook my hand, he sat down. He didn't ask me to sit, sit down, so I stood for 45 minutes. And he had a great influence in terms of giving a lot of students uh, the chance to succeed and really uh, making a difference and making some allowances for people that didn't succeed that well or struggling like I was at that time. And there were very, very few people who could have done what he did to start a school in the early 30s, make it into a full-fledged junior college, and then four-year degree giving program. President Conrad was very interested in and committed to doing something about the environment well ahead of his time. The forestry program included three majors at that time, forest management, recreation management, and wildlife management. Paul White was the head of the forestry program. Our forestry program had woodsman's weekends, they called them, and the colleges from all over came. There was wood cutting that involved two-man saws. There was wood chopping. Part of the fundraising effort was an annual game dinner, and that would come along at the end of deer season because venison was prominently featured and game stew was made up of any game that showed up that wasn't venison. People loved it. We sold out every year. It was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. It did take a little creativity with seasoning. To <laughs> We had a volunteer fire department with 24 members. We had three crews of eight and we rotated around so that there would be one crew around the campus all the time. I did attend some of the ceremonies for the 150th anniversary of Nichols. I will say I was a kid then, uh, but I do remember some of that celebration. Back in 64 and 65, through the colonel's guidance, he wanted to really spend the year focusing on the school's 150th anniversary. One thing that we did do was to have the first live show on campus, and it was the Brothers Four. Back in those days, it was very significant to have a major group peer on campus at the Fieldhouse. Probably the biggest event at that point in the college's history. Herb Durfee was the campus security officer. He was a big, imposing, impressive, wonderful guy. If you'd done something stupid and gotten plastered and needed a hand going to bed, Herb would help you. There was a riot behind Budley, and there were about 20 guys out there who were trying to tip over a car. And Herb showed up and got out of his car, and he had that situation straightened out in about 20 seconds. And it was very clear that that was not acceptable behavior. And that's the way it was with Herb. You knew where he had stood. In 1971, the president at that time decided to broaden the horizon, and so he added liberal arts programs and bachelor of arts courses. So that's and we dropped the business administration at that point, although we still maintained that program throughout and still do. Nichols has always placed great emphasis on teaching, not research. Although there are some fine researchers here at the college, teaching was the main focus. That's what's different about Nichols, and still is different. We were having a very, very rigid academic schedule, which uh, meant class after class after class. We had Saturday classes. We were going basically five and a half days. Classroom experience varied tremendously. We had one accounting professor who said, you can't take notes quickly enough with a pencil because the friction on the paper will slow you down. You need to bring ballpoint pens. They were the people that made it happen for me. They spent the time and the effort to nurture me, uh, help me and guide me through the process.
My senior year, I was asked to be part of the Christmas card photo, and we ended up going to a bison farm, which is right down the road in Brooklyn, Connecticut. What? So it has over 150 bison down there. I did not know that. Yep. So Somebody asked me the other day, they said, why are you called the bison if there's no bison? So we went down there. It was me with Susan Engelmeyer. They told me to not touch the bison. I still touch the bison, obviously. Of it was the first time I've seen a bison in real life, obviously. <laughs>we have a nice, successful history and a long history. It's been the heartbeat of the college. Nichols was competing against the Harvards and the BCs and, and the Albanys, uh, who are all now Division I institutions back in the 60s and 70s, and they were winning those contests. Hal Chalmers, a legend, beginning the stages of a varsity program here, and then Mike Vendetti, another legend, picking up where Hal Chalmers left off. Coach Vendetti had value systems they brought with them that were pretty clear and pretty wonderful. Mike Vendetti, when I joined, he already had one championship under his belt the fall of 73. And then uh, he had four championships in a row, then he missed one year, and then he had another championship. The teams were truly outstanding. Competition was very intense. And those young men were in my class. Many of them were serious athletes. But you know what? They also were, in almost all cases, the best and most determined students following the teams, following the athletes, but also seeing them in another role in class as they're learning and maturing. It's really a complete thing. I talk to a lot of alumni all the time. And I was on the phone with a guy who was from the class of 65. He said, oh, they have girls going there now? When they went to school, they didn't have women on campus. If their girlfriends came to stay, they had to stay at the White House at the bottom of the hill. You're kidding. I kid you not. Word right, right from his mouth. One of the problems that a business school had at that time was that women were not going into business. And I had this discussion with one president whose point was they won't. That's why we're getting a bachelor's degree program in arts. I said, I think they will. And we started and we were supposed to have it enter in 72, but then uh, several people came in and said, we live in a neighborhood, can we take courses there? And the answer was, well, yeah, I guess so. So the seven to nine showed up that first year. It was a tremendous boost for the college. And my feeling is that we probably wouldn't be here now if it hadn't been for the fact that we did this. They came and went into business immediately. I've been associated with Nichols one way or another, literally since birth. My dad, George Gromelski, was the bursar and treasurer here. I've had the fortunate opportunity of living in a dormitory when I was a kid. I had always grown up thinking I would never attend Nichols because it, would, it was an all-male school and then all of a sudden it was open to women and that really changed my life thinking. Gradually, women's enrollment by the mid to late 80s achieved a proportion of 30, 35 percent and it's still in the 35 or 40 percent range. And women were a key part of the school both academically where they tended to prosper well and on the athletic field. The first women's sport was softball, and that was uh, started by Mike Vendetti, and the coach was Bill Steglitz. He was the first coach, and if you look at the football field, we just played in a section of grass down there. One of the things that I'm most proud of is having been part of both the first softball team and the first basketball team for women that Nichols had. I was very proud of that, particularly when you look at the fine traditions of women's athletics that have developed since then.
today, almost nobody knows all the presidents, and I'm one of the few who still does. I came here in the fall of 73. Gordon Cross, who had been president in the late 1960s, had been replaced by Darcy Coyle, who was the college's third president. But one day in my first uh, semester here in the fall, I was with Leslie Brooks, who is a veteran faculty member, and he said, Ed, I need to introduce you to somebody who was walking up the walk. And this gentleman was, in fact, James L. Conrad, the founding president, the colonel of the college. I was involved with the search committee to select a new president, and out of that came the college's fourth president, Lowell C. Smith. President Smith was incredibly involved in trying to make a community-oriented place, re outreach to the community, outreach to the staff. During the course of several years, the college changed fundamentally in terms of the physical plant. The enlargement of the student center, additional housing in Shammy Hall. We also changed to a much more complex lighting system. The opponents could actually see the baskets and that was unfortunate from the standpoint of the basketball coaches. Davis Hall was notable in that it was devoted almost entirely to the use of computers. There was a program called Nichols 2000 and that was geared toward what is the college going to be in 14 years when we get to the turn of the century. And the college began moving, some of the curriculum began to change. That ultimately culminated in 1986 to every student having a personal computer at Nichols, and we got a, quite a bit of recognition for that. Over the 80s and through the 90s, it infiltrated into the, every level of the school. We required students to have computers. We were one of the first schools. When I came in here, all I knew about computers in 86 was how to turn the switch on. I actually took a class in the day school and some of the students were upset that a professor was sitting next to it. It was sort of fun for me. Back in the 1980s, we would create this unique program called the Institute for American Values, otherwise known as the IAV. And they did a nationwide search and they found a gentleman by the name of Bob Fisher. At the time, the intent was to have a think tank where students could be exposed to uh, politicians and leaders and business leaders and people from all walks of life to talk about American values and what that meant in the 1980s. Roger Carney, who was the previous Dean of Students at the time, picked up the baton from Bob Fisher and became the second director in, uh, after Bob's passing. He created a, a broader perspective. It moved from more focusing just on conservative American values to American values in general. And they integrated more of the arts. They had theater and music. They had film. Part of the Institute also incorporated our study abroad program which has now grown significantly over the past 10 years. Uh, and so the Institute helped to expose our students to a wide range of things that really hold value. In the 90s, I began using what the students have come to call the Downsisms. Downsism number one is, if you blow it, admit it and face it. And when things go well, Downsism 15 is onward and upward. Downsy specifically put one phrase in my brain and it has served me extremely well in a, a sales environment and uh, that's uh, if if you can't dazzle them with detail baffle them with bullshit has been very productive in my career thus far if you were a freshman he would basically say the highest grade you could get in your freshman principles of marketing class was a C plus like if you're competitive about your GPA you hate it um, but in hindsight, it's a great lesson. And I hate that he got this out of me, but I made sure that I got A's in the rest of his classes. At the end of the day, what does that C plus mean now? To me, nothing. So what it did teach me early on is that you literally can do all of the right things, all of them, and still fail. But you can't stop doing all the right things just in case so that you don't lose the opportunity to be successful. In January of 1998, President DeRosdy decided to resign at the end of the year, and they asked me to be president. So I started as president then in July of 1998. The school was in crisis. There was a number of small private schools like ours were closing, and there was a major concern that Nichols would close. 
The people that stayed, and most of us did, were really committed to the school. I mean, we went five years without raises. With that leadership from Deborah, we did grow. Our college had been in some trouble, and, and we turned things around rather well, I think. We started new, new programs. The campus became a beautiful place to be. We doubled enrollments. We added curriculum. We added uh, faculty. We spent about $45 million in capital projects. We strengthened athletics, and uh, we strengthened the student services so there were activities to do all the time. I walked over to uh, the snack bar and the TV was on and we're looking at the TV and I see the plane hit the tower and we're all like, oh my God, that helplessness, it was horrifying. I just remember it being an event that tied us all in together. Like, where were you when 9-11 happened? And I was here. I actually cried every single time the national anthem came on for the rest of the games that I was involved in. I mean, it was crazy. Jimmy was my roommate at the time, longest two days of my life, I would say. The school really came together. We had really wanted to reinvigorate the, uh, the student center, and we wanted to relocate the, the radio station. You know, we thought, or no better person to get dedicated to Jimmy. He was by far the most successful radio personality on the, the Nichols campus. You know, people tuned in. You could tell it was a, a passion of his, and it's, it's only right that, you know, he lives, you know, forever in the radio station. I think my all-time favorite memory from freshman year would be when the Red Sox won the World Series and everybody was in their dorm rooms and listening to the game, and you could hear everybody, you know, having little parties. And then as soon as they won, everybody rushed to Shammy Lawn. I think for everybody that went to school at that time, that was probably, everybody remembers that moment. Nichols College has a national championship uh, to its name. It's the men's national champion in racquetball back in the mid-90s. We had no racquetball courts. We didn't have a program. And we started it in September. And by April, we were the men's national championship beating big universities across the country. Coming into my senior year, I think I needed 36 points. We played Worcester State. In the second half, I needed six points. And my coach said, you need to score this. So I had gotten four. I went up for a layup. I got fouled. I needed two points at the free throw line. So I made the first one, and my team was on the bench going, don't miss it. It's only for your thousand. And then I made the second one, and that's how I scored my thousand. The team had got me flowers. People were jumping up and down on top of me. The last five people that are on that banner I played with. So there was five of us in my four-year career that scored a thousand points, which is pretty cool. I remember when I got to Nichols and students would wear everybody else's paraphernalia and uh, we, we don't want them wearing other shirts and we might have been their third or fourth choice. So one of the goals was to make us what's called a destination college. We want students who want to be at Nichols. So we became, I think, a destination college and I think that was the beginning that helped to turn the school to the direction that you see today. Everything that was happening here was nothing I'd seen before. The way that this entire community embraced the football team, the way that they held student athletes accountable. I don't think there was a professor that I had that I didn't see at an event. But they were passionate about athletes. They were passionate about um, vesting in people who were vested in the school. The coaching staff was more interested in what the kids were doing on the academic side. And some of the academic faculty members were always interested in what the kids were doing out of the classroom. How were they doing in their sport? So I think each understood the value of the other in this comprehensive education that our students are receiving. Field hockey, when I came to Nichols, at one point we were playing in the center of campus. So we always had a crowd. Unfortunately, at 5 o'clock when the dinner bell went off, the crowd went to get dinner and then they came back to watch the second half. I came back here to speak about helping um, young adults be prepared for the next level. And one of the last pieces that I talked about, and I looked out, I saw Coach Carbon. He took the school from a point where I believe that graduating class that I came into, that senior class, hadn't won a home game. We won a homecoming game. That dramatically redefines the culture of a sports team. 
When we got into the 2000s, then we really started to hit some milestones. Women's soccer being the first team ever to have an opportunity to win their championship and go on and represent the institution in the NCAAs. The most exciting thing was freshman year when we hosted a playoff playoff game for the first time in school history. Just the crowd that was here, just the student support, the other teams that came to support us, and we went into double overtime and I think we won because we had that student backing. In 2011, the NCAA was looking for a home for their field hockey championship, and our field hockey coach, Krista Mallett, asked, could we do it? And we put on a phenomenal championship. We gained national recognition for what we did 2013-14, we hosted four Commonwealth Coast Conference championships, one for women's tennis, one for men's tennis, uh, basketball, and men's ice hockey. There were people almost hanging off the rafters. We had so many folks there. Lots of school pride, enthusiasm, chants, cheers. It was terrific. I... Um became the editor of the newspaper and yearbook in 1964 and the company that did the yearbook asked me if I would consider joining them. So in the fall of 1965 I uh, joined Jostens, did that for 37 years. Of all things it became uh, without question a very successful career. I decided to be a college coach, I think, halfway through because of what I saw the coaches doing here. The best thing Nichols does, and I think does for all of their students, is the career preparation. Sitting on the senior staff of our top leaders within the company, definitely being a leader within student government prepared me for that. Helps me understand what it would be like when you get out there and you have to influence and get buy-in from CEOs and presidents of divisions. So being my first year in the real world, so to speak, I just had a comfort level with it because I was so used to it from my involvements on campus. And that's definitely what made me stick out and go to a role where I really have oversight of a global organization. I spent a great deal of time going through student newspapers beginning in 1931, ending 1990, I found I was terribly impressed with the students and how they approached their futures. And I think we contributed to that. The teaching style and uh, the classroom has really changed a lot. We used to be much more lecture driven, uh, exams driven, and now it's sort of more the flipped classroom. It's much more interactive. When we started changing the curriculum, the core curriculum back in 99, 2000, we really started to stress uh, oral expression uh, presentation, uh, c communication with audiences. So those skills get, get built up r right from the start. I, I think that's made Nichols pretty unusual. Every year, students take one semester of professional development seminar, which over the time prepares them to know how to go out and do interviews. Nichols is very unique in that. All of our students create an elevator speech, so that's a one-minute pitch about who you are and how are you going to get hired. And I will tell you, I think they all hate it. But at the same time, I have so many students come back to me and say, that was so helpful. We make them work in groups a lot, and so as part of groups, I often see leaders emerge who never would have thought of themselves as leaders, but they're put in a position where they need to be in order to make the group successful. The professors are very caring and very you know, enthusiastic about their students. You weren't just learning from the book. You were learning from you know, people that have actually been there that say, oh yeah, that's a great philosophy, but it's not really accurate in the real world. There were several avenues for you to be successful here. Several. I mean, I think that's what makes the school unique. Does it give people more chances to succeed than it does to fail? Gerald Fells, a very prominent alumnus of the college, was an interim president for a year or so. It was a crucial time, it was a transitional time, and he wasn't just filling the seat, he managed to build the student union. He's the one that pushed that forward. He, he restructured our debt. He approved a number of new faculty positions, uh, which we were able to fill. The college needed something on an interim basis because they got relatively short notice as far as uh, President Townsley leaving. You know, why don't I just volunteer my services? and. Uh, so that's what I decided to do. We were talking about this student center for, for like six years, and we never really got it off the ground. We got a lot of input from, from the faculty, from students, you know, what they were looking for in terms of campus centers. 
It's the heart of the campus. It's where everything kind of meets. And that's how this, this building got designed, really, was a collaborative effort. And eventually, you know, this is what, uh, what we came up with. There was another black kid who graduated from Nichols in 2008, and he saw me, and he's like, I can't believe there are alumni from Nichols that are minorities. Like, shocked at the fact. And I remember um, when I first got here, there was about 100 of us total. Most of us played sports. Professor McCoy led this charge, created this group called Umoja. I think it's Swahili for unity. He basically takes a bunch of minorities and non-minorities, or just people, and put them in a room where we could ask each other questions. Like, and no question was out of bounds, because I think he saw that we had to get to know one another. So my classmates and peers that graduated benefited from that program. All three of my children are currently attending Nichols. My oldest, Patrick, was interested in Nichols, had looked at about six different schools, and he hit it off right away. My second one looked at, it seems like, 30 different schools. He was adamant he was not going to go to Nichols. He was down to two different schools. He ended up going to Nichols, um, and his fourth day at Nichols, he tweeted out it was the greatest decision of his life. My last one, she ultimately chose to come to Nichols. We came into a meeting, and I mentioned my name, and he says, oh, are you Patrick Hoy's dad? And I said, uh-oh. That's not usually good. But they said, boy, he's really gotten involved. He'll go to basketball games and paint his head green and, and get everybody excited. And, and my son, Sean, is the same way. President Engelmeyer embodies the qualities of Nichols. She is involved with the students. She cares about them. Uh, she's a very warm person personally, and that resonates to the students. She has time for each and every student, and she's also committed to growth. She comes from a little different angle, strong academic backgrounds. Now in the college, is really on a much more sounder footing from a financial standpoint, from a standpoint of, of recognition. Uh, now it's really to, to bring the college to a, to a higher level. I started as president in summer of 2011, and uh, I came in at a really fortunate time because, like many small institutions, Nichols had had a, a few financial challenges in the past, but now we're in a very solid financial situation, so it allowed us the opportunity to dream about what we really wanted to be. We've uh, increased the number of endowed scholarships, we broke ground on a new academic building, and the list goes on. It's a, a fun place with lots of activity. We have a president here that has a very strong, good, and implementable vision for what this school can be. Nichols is once again at a seminal moment in its history. It's at a place where the board has come to understand, the faculty, the staff, and the administration has come to understand there are going to be significant changes here. And not changes in terms of the community, but changes in terms of increasing its education awareness to the rest of the world. I chose this college not just because um, it was a very good accounting college, which I wanted to get my major in, but also because of the size of the campus. I followed suit because on the first day that we dropped him off, I drove onto campus and I knew that this is where I wanted to be. It definitely felt like home away from home. I was like, I'm not going there. I went through high school, my brother and sister, uh, everyone knew them. And then I was like, I don't want to be Little Flavin again. I don't want to be, I didn't want that. And then so dad and I drove to all different universities on the East Coast. We went, he took vacation days. We almost died in the car 13 times. And then when we finally came to Nichols, we walked to the campus, one of the last schools we visited. Uh, actually, it was the last school we visited. We were walking around, and it just felt right. We all had opportunities to go elsewhere, and somehow we all ended up here. And I think it's funny because we've all had different experiences here. We had different groups of friends, and yet it's still our home away from home. When I look at some of the publications of the early academies, I note that those who were teaching and running the academy in the mid-19th century were concerned about well-rounded, well-educated, knowledgeable people that knew the arts, the sciences, the performing arts, that knew something about ethics and standards of behavior in the working world and the professional world. All of that was important, and I think we see that in the college today, and the roots for that are in the old academy.
I think the college has the same mission that it did back when I went, to help young people get a job out in the workforce. The overall spirit of the college, it's developing the next business leaders of the future. Clearly, without question, it was the most important decision that I made coming here to Nichols in 1961, meeting some of the most wonderful classmates I could have met and allowing me to take an extracurricular activity and make it into a full-fledged career. The college has been able to adapt to a radically changing academic and real-world environment. It's been here for 200 years. It has a solid foundation. It's learned through a lot of experimentation and it's been very versatile in making the changes that have been able to take it to the next level. I see it being one of the leaders in business education in the, in the decades to come. The fact that Nichols has been around for 200 years to me is something that's very special and we've always prepared our students for the working force. From the past legends to the present legends to the energy of our young student athletes and our young coaches, those are the folks who have set the tone for our student athletes to come in and know that they can achieve success. It's just very gratifying to see a student come in as a first year student and four years later and to think we had a small part to play in their development. For us to graduate a couple hundred students on a Saturday morning was immensely rewarding. My single wish for students is that their dreams come true and I hope that their stories 20, 30 years from now are the same I hear when I meet alumni from the 50s, 60s, 70s that Nichols made the difference for them. The school has been very strong, very certain, always small. We've gotten here because we have been consistent in what we do, no matter what happens tomorrow. We're in good shape because we have gathered much strength from our past. We had one, one class member that really wasn't pulling his weight, so we uh, remember we had to go to Professor Downs and tell him what was going on and you know he kind of gave us some advice on how to handle it and we ended up firing the student <laughs> from, our, from our working group. When I was in my first year as an RA, I had to write him up. Oh, I left my music on. Yes, I left my music on. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning and his stereo was blaring. He's like, what do you mean you have to write me up? We had some interesting uh, journeys before we ended up together after college. We had to read three books throughout the course of the year, and then you had to write a report on it. And I stayed up until 4 o'clock in the morning before it was due did. for your final. There you go. And I woke up in an absolute panic because I had missed my 8 a.m. class. And I had this like beautiful like pamphlet that I had worked so hard on and I sprinted up Center Road, shoeless, in a tank top with gym shorts, met, uh. met Professor Halpern in the middle of Center Road, breathless, handed it to him, said, I'm so sorry, turned around and walked away. He thought, thought it was the funniest thing I've ever seen.